All right. Uh, good morning. Carrying on gas analyzers, uh, ILM 310304B. Uh, carrying on where we left off with part A uh, last lecture. Uh, we'll finish up talking about dew point analyzers, um, talking about the operation and calibration of the dew point analyzers just to close off that topic. And then we'll moving into looking at moisture analyzers. Uh, and then we jump right into combustible, uh, com combustible chemical reactions. Um, and oxygen analyzers and combustion analyzers, and that balloons into uh, a pretty big subject, um, not just in analyzers, but it carries over into chemistry as well, and also carries over into measurement. So it's a pretty large component to the third year package uh, that is uh, combustion. So our goals today, uh, we'll get another control here. Describe the operation and calibration of dew point analyzers, uh, principles of analysis and application of moisture analyzers, and then combustible uh, chemical reactions. And I deliberated the other day whether I was going to do this PowerPoint first, uh, or if it would have been better to do a chemistry one first. But uh, as I read through it, the, the chemical reactions that we're going to look at here are, are pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, and if you don't get them right now, they will become very evident in the next chemistry lecture. Uh, and then oxygen analyzers and combustion analyzers. So um, good stuff in here. Okay, objective one, describe the operation and calibration of dew point sensors. Dew point sensors can be calibrated basically in, in three different ways according to the module. Uh, the first one is remove it from service and send it to a lab for verification. Uh, the second one is remove them and compare to a site secondary standard, which is probably most likely. Uh, and then third is field calibrating against a reference or a dew point standard. So we'll have a quick look at um, the last two. Anyway, the first one's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, we'll look at the last two here and what's involved um, with this secondary standards or these different types of standards for dew points. The first one we're going to look at is called a moisture calibrator. And as you see from the diagram here, a moisture calibrator takes uh, dry, dry gas, feeds it through uh, a mechanism that saturates it with water, uh, allows that uh, moisturized water to come up to the top and be re reintroduced, blended with some dry air uh, in order to create a ratio uh, of moisture in the air that we're looking for uh, to calibrate our dew point sensor. Then it feeds that uh, simulated environment into a, uh, an area of the device where we have the uh, reference instrument and the test sensor together, and it does a comparison between the two uh, measuring devices. So uh, its definition uh, in the ILM here is a moisture calibrator is used to generate different atmospheres to which we can calibrate our sensors. And again, does that by combining a, a wet flow with a dry flow. Uh, in different ratios, we can, of course, different uh, make different atmospheres of moisture. And we just compare them. So this is known as a, a reference comparison sort of method. The second one we look at here are a different type of moisture standards. Uh, and when we're talking about moisture standards uh, for dew point here, um, these standards are saturated solutions of different salts. Um, and it's exactly what it sounds like if you're mixing up a, uh, a glass of salt water, for example, it's got a certain amount of uh, characteristics to it uh, and depending on the type of salt it will have varying characteristics. Um, we have a nice little table here that shows us the, the different types of salts that can be used and the relative humidities uh, that they can that they can generate for, for use in calibration. So again uh, not uh, Something you're not going to have to memorize this entire chart or anything like that, but you do, of course, have to know what the moisture standards are and how, how to apply them. So this process is relatively simple. You put the saturated salt solution uh, in the bottle of a vessel. Uh, it creates water vapor uh, based on uh, its vaporization uh, temperature, which has something to do with the salts, and it creates that environment that we compare uh, our measuring devices against. This is a little bit less accurate than the uh, previous one where we generate the different environments, but it's probably uh, one of the more common field methods uh, to do. Um, the moisture calibrator here is, is uh, something that you'd have to have 
uh, uh, lab probably to have that piece of equipment, um, whereas a saturated salt or something that you can just have on the shelf and mix up whenever you need it. Uh, last but not least here, we have sensor validation testing. Um, rather than a real calibration, a validation check is just used to verify the current reading of the sensor as it is in service. Um, a reference sensor is used to verify a single point and the measuring sensor is left in position. Uh, this is probably the easiest way to do it. This is not any different than doing a, a bump test on a gas detector head, for example. Um, if you know the gas detector is supposed to trip at 20 ppm, you go there with a, uh, a bottle of whatever it happens to be, 5, 10, 15, or 20 ppm, whatever it happens to be, and you feed it to that uh, analyzer, and if the reading on the analyzer shows what you have in the bottle, then you call it good. Um, so that's the same idea uh, here with this dew point uh, validation test here. If you want to do a multi-point test, as it highlights in the ILM here, you have to remove the sensor from service and then use that moisture calibrator in order to generate different atmospheres uh, to which you can calibrate it against. Some considerations uh, to take when we're, we're doing calibrations here. Uh, start it with the driest sample first. Uh, again, it's easier to you know, measure twice, cut once. Or, or start out dry and gradually add moisture to it than it is to try to take the moisture out afterwards. Uh, don't rush, be patient, give ample time for the analyzer to, to do its work and to stabilize. Uh, Using a controlled atmosphere. Uh, again, there's different uh, atmospheric conditions, temperatures and atmospheric pressures and things like that that come into play when we're dealing with uh, moisture in a gas. So we wanna make sure that we kind of standardize things as much as we can. Uh, they recommend using stainless tubing um, as plastic and rubber have uh, the potential to absorb water. And as a general rule, they say that it is recommended to calibrate off-site if, uh, if you can. So that kind of wraps up the end of uh, dew point and that leads us into the next objective, which is uh, looking at moisture, uh, moisture analysis of so principles uh, of analysis and application of different types of moisture analyzers. So something new for us to look at. Right off the hop, we'll define moisture analysis, uh, which is the measurement of water in all of its forms in any type of a material. For us, uh, it, it deals with uh, moisture in different processes, uh, such as natural gas, different fuels, powdered solids, coal, wood, uh, things of that nature where we're concerned um, with the quality of our product and the impact that moisture would have uh, on, that product, on that product. So uh, not knowing the moisture content, uh, of course, can cause issues in a process uh, such as pipeline corrosion and failure uh, due to rusting, of course, uh, clumping in solids uh, and poor petroleum feedstock. So there are uh, many applications for um, using moisture analysis, something that wasn't measured in here uh, or listed in here is uh, like sawmills, for example. Uh, wood is one of these things that has to have a certain moisture content in it um, in order to be a, a good consumer product. So another application where moisture analysis is relatively important. Okay, when we're talking about the amount of moisture in something, uh, from some relatively uh, straightforward units uh, to deal with, uh, regarding these, so parts per million or percent, depending on the part of uh, the amount of moisture in the sample. Uh, if there's not much moisture, uh, your parts per million. Uh, if there's lots of moisture, uh, it's probably in a, in a percentage. And we can express this uh, by volume or by, by weight. And again, uh, looks a little bit overwhelming, the, the number of different things that we see here. Um, but it's really not too bad. So PPMV means volume, PPMW means weight, and percent W is, is a weight of, of water. And then of course, to get it into uh, millions, we're, we're multiplying by 10 to the six, and to get it into percentage, we multiply by 100. So it's not uh, terrible, terrible math. And then again, uh, identifying it by the type of measurement, so PPM by volume, uh, tells us right away that it's going to be a certain volume of water vapor per volume of gas and then multiply by 10 to 6 to get to that parts per million area. Uh, if it's weight, it's going to be the weight of water over the weight of the sample. 
and if it's percentage uh, weight, um, again, it's weight. So it's pretty self-explanatory. I don't know if there's actually any exercises in the ILM. Maybe I'll just have a quick, uh, quick look. I don't think there is any exercises regarding this, um, but it is a good skill to be able to convert between parts per million, parts per million, uh, and percentages and, and things like that, because uh, different analyzers will, of course, use different units of measure. Okay, uh, look at some gas and liquid moisture analyzers here on a handy little table off of page seven. Um, you'll see some familiar items here. The impedance and capacitance uh, moisture analyzers uh, are similar in operation to the ones that we uh, looked at when we were talking about dew point and relative uh, humidity. Um, they can be used for both gas and liquid phase samples. A couple of new devices that we're going to look at uh, include infrared absorption, uh, which is also good for two phases here, gas and liquids. And then the last one, which is microwave uh, absorption, which is uh, generally uh, used for liquid sample phases. But uh, I think that contradicts itself. We'll see what happens here in the next couple of slides. So we'll look at some applications uh, of these different devices. Impedance capacitance, uh, we don't really hit on them too much because we already talked about them, but we'll touch on them a little bit here and then we'll get into these two. Okay, so impedance sensors uh, measure dew point and uh, capacitive generally are used for measuring the relative humidity of air. Uh, they can also be used elsewhere like liquid hydrocarbon applications where there is very little water uh, and there's a typo. They are suitable for direct mounting with high pressures and temperatures and we made some references to pipeline applications for uh, impedance sensors uh, in the previous lecture uh, and we talked briefly about those flashback direct uh, arresters or those sintered steel filters uh, that we have to put on there to uh, stop the propagation of uh, any flame uh, between the analyzer housing and the process uh, and the process itself. Pros and cons uh, of these devices here, uh, wide measuring range, they're good for uh, both phases uh, high operating uh, pressure range, that's uh, that's the uh, impedance one, sorry. Cons, uh, direct contact with the liquid may damage the sensors, uh, temperature must be constant, and corrosive samples uh, can be damaging. So that kind of blanket covers uh, both uh, the impedance and the capacitance uh, style moisture measuring devices as we talked about in previous lectures. Next application uh, is going to be the IR absorption style here. IR, if you've forgotten, stands for infrared, uh, and they basically operate by sending a, a beam of infrared light through the sample. As we see here, we have a sample lamp shining through a window in a, in a sample cell, uh, through a window on the other side to the detector, and we feed our sample through this sample cell, and the water would absorb uh, some of the light, uh, attenuating or weakening this light beam, uh, and that is detected uh, as lost by the IR detector on the other side. Uh, more, more water equals more light lost than lower signal received on this side here. Uh, and pretty straightforward kind of uh, path sort of measuring, uh, measuring method here. Used for corrosive samples due to the fact that it's non-contact, we have the devices uh, outside of these uh, cell windows so they're not contacting the process directly. Uh, pros include uh, use for gas and liquids and also a wide measuring range. The cons of this type of device is a sample must be relatively uh, clear. Uh, the light has to be able to pass through it. Solids, of course, uh, may coat the viewing windows and that can potentially be a problem or a maintenance issue uh, in the future. Next application is the microwave style absorption analyzer. Uh, it uses microwaves basically the same way the IR uses the infrared light. Um, as the sample moisture absorbs the microwaves, it heats up and uh, less gets to the receiver. And microwaves are only absorbed by water, and specifically the hydrogen in water and not by the solids, and that's kind of how they work. They get absorbed by the hydrogen uh, in the process, and the relative concentration of uh, hydrogen can be measured. Microwave is often used in uh, food manufacturing industry because it is a non-contact 
uh, type of measurement. Uh, generally, uh, it can be in pipe mounted as well. Um, but one of the big things is that it's a non-contact measuring device. So pros, non-contact uh, can be used on slurries and high solid pastes. And a non-visible wavelength of light means that you don't have to worry about uh, fouling of the windows uh, that you would have with an IR absorption style moisture um, analyzer. Cons, not good for low PPMs and not suitable for gases because they are not dense enough. So that's the devices uh, and applications um, for uh, moisture measurement. Um, and we talk about the different phases, the gas phase and the liquid phase. The next uh, little section here talks about how do we deal with uh, using uh, analyzers that are made for one phase, uh, but we don't have it. We need to somehow generate uh, that type of an environment. So looking at uh, gas analyzers, um, but liquid samples, is there a way that we can get uh, around doing that? And there absolutely is. Uh, so in order to use a gas sensor on a liquid sample, one of two things, of course, has to happen. Uh, we have to either vaporize the liquid into uh, a gas, or we have to strip the gas from the liquid uh, in something called a stripping column uh, and a coalescing filter. And that's what this diagram represents here, is a stripping column uh, where the water vapor uh, comes up, uh, the coalescing filter uh, takes, takes, does some additional stripping, uh, and then the nitrogen and water vapor uh, moves off to the moisture analyzer. A uh, little more complicated, requires some hardware. Um, this, uh, you know, it's not as uh, difficult to do, I guess. You basically have to heat it up and vaporize it into a gas. And depending on your application and your process, uh, will kind of dictate which method that you, that you have to use here. Um, but it can be done. All right, uh, measuring moisture in solids. We've talked about liquids and gases quite a bit. We haven't mentioned anything about solids, so the next few slides here uh, deal with that uh, application. Um, solid moisture analyzers measure the content as material passes by through a conveyor or a chute uh, as a general rule, and we look at three different types. Um, and there's quite a, quite a write-up on, on most of these ones. Uh, here, but they are more or less uh, kind of similar in the way that they work. We have some kind of a material flow on a conveyor or, or whatever it happens to be here. We have a scraper that's set in place so that we can maintain a consistent uh, depth uh, of medium. And then we have our measuring device uh, that's going to put out some type of energy, uh, which is generally going to be absorbed by the hydrogen in the material uh, and then uh, measured as a difference. The first one uh, is called a, a neutron. Uh, I'm sure there's a better name for it, but it's neutron-based. Uh, and this is kind of a little bit out there, but uh, something interesting to talk about at supper time. Uh, fast neutrons collide with hydrogen in the sample and get slowed down. When this happens, they turn into something called thermal or moderated uh, neutrons. And then the thermal neutron detector will detect this and give a reading, uh, reading that is proportional to the amount of uh, hydrogen, which is representative of the amount of water uh, in the sample here. So uh, everything you need to know about it is probably here on, on this particular slide. Uh, no nuclear physics here to, to worry about today. Second type, oops, sorry, got ahead of myself there. Neutron applications, uh, cement, coal, mining ores, so uh, probably a good reason why we don't see them too much here in Alberta because uh, not a whole bunch of mining, uh, coal and cement. We do have some of that, but uh, by and large, we're mostly oil and gas. So you might not have seen these. Um, pros and cons, uh, pros in green uh, provides an average moisture measurement across the, the width of the sample here. Uh, the downside uh, is it can pick up other sources uh, of hydrogen. Uh, some of them could be, for example, uh, hydrogen in, in, oh, I guess I can't think of a good example off the top of my head, um, but it can pick up other sources of uh, hydrogen as well. 
Next application for solids moisture is microwave. Um, and again, it's relatively comparable in operation terms uh, to, um, to what we saw with the neutron. It's just another type of radio, uh, radiation. Uh, the intensity of the microwave received is proportional to the amount of water in the sample. So that's the same. Uh, used for liquids and solids, very similar to neutron style. Uh, one of the things mentioned in the ILM uh, with this one here is that you can use an optional uh, gamma ray density meter on the side uh, to compensate for density changes in, in the material here. So uh, again, process uh, is, is generally the same as it was with neutron material flow on a conveyor belt, scraper to maintain consistent uh, depth. And then it's just a matter of how much energy uh, does the hydrogen in the sample uh, absorb, uh, and that is subtracted from the original signal by the um, by the receiver, and we get a relative measurement based on that. Uh, last but not least, here um, infrared uh, used for gas and liquid samples, and again, uh, this one's a little bit different here, where we have the light being. Uh, reflected off the sample in this case here. Um, we learned earlier, I think we talked about IR earlier, um, but water absorbs IR rays, funny, water absorbs all of these different rays, uh, and its intensity received is relative to the water in the sample. So the principle of operation is very standard uh, as we look at all of these devices. Um, caveat when using this IR style here is that the material must be able to reflect infrared light in order for it to work. So there are some applications uh, where this um, may not work as well. None specifically uh, mentioned in the ILM, but that is something to uh, remember that this one does work off of reflective properties. Applications uh, for IR include snack foods, tobacco, and wood products. Uh, pros and cons here, simple in installation, again in green for the pros, red for the cons. Uh, low maintenance, again, this is a non-contact kind of thing, so there's not a lot of stuff that you have to worry about. Uh, con to this one here is that it only measures the surface, um, so that's kind of unique um, with this uh, IR style. And again, uh, repeating ourselves, the surface must be uh, reflective. So that wraps up um, the relative humidity dew point moisture measurement section of gas analyzers. And from this point on, um, we move into uh, combustion. Um, and that's the remainder of this ILM, as well as I think the next ILM uh, in its entirety, uh, if I remember correctly here. So lots of stuff coming down the pipe here in terms of combustion. Again, uh, there's interplay between different subjects, chemistry, measurements, and analyzers when we're talking about combustion. Um, so this is a pretty significant uh, component of the third year material as a, as a whole. Okay, so our objective uh, here is to describe combustible chemical reactions. And I said earlier, I kind of deliberated uh, whether or not I should introduce this before doing the chemistry unit that kind of leads into this. Um, but what we're going to look at today is, is uh, hopefully simple enough uh, that it doesn't confuse you. Uh, if it does, um, it'll all become very clear in the next chemistry lecture. OK, so let's describe what a combustible chemical reaction is, first of all. Uh, combustion is a type of reaction uh, when oxygen reacts with some kind of a fuel to create heat. Uh, many of us are familiar with the combustion triangle where you have uh, energy, fuel, and, uh, and oxygen, and then we get uh, heat from it. We can show it in a chemical equation. That's largely what we're going to be doing for the rest of this ILM. Uh, the equations are helpful because they show us, uh, they use the symbols um, for the starting materials, the product materials, and, and the relative amounts. So it's really like a, a recipe. Um, in order to get the reaction that we're looking for. Um, when we talk about these starting materials, product materials, and their relative amounts, these are expressed in uh, the react uh, reaction equation. Uh, and the reaction equations always start out with the reactants uh, over here on the left-hand side, and then the products over here on the right-hand side, uh, an arrow indicating 
which way the reaction is going or that a reaction is happening. That's what kind of what the arrow does. And then we'll get into the details uh, in terms of different elements that are, that are used. So the most basic one that we start out with uh, when we're talking about combustion is carbon reacting with oxygen uh, to create carbon dioxide. So this is kind of our dip our, our big toe in the pool here uh, to get us going in the, in the direction of what we're gonna be uh, looking for here. So here in this example, carbon plus oxygen, these are the reactants on the left-hand side of the arrow, and they combine together, cation and anion together to make CO2. Uh, in here, we can we can look at the ratios. We we know that there's there's uh, one uh, molecule of carbon. There's one molecule of oxygen, which is contains two atoms. Don't confuse yourself. But oxygen as a gas has two atoms, but one molecule of oxygen is looks like this. And then when they combine, uh, they're in a ratio of of one to one because we don't see any other uh, numbers here. And that's kind of what we're going to be looking at in the next in the next few slides. Okay, so in this course, we talk about hydrocarbon combustion uh, in terms of analyzing it for efficiency purposes. This is the analyzer uh, course, of course. Uh, so we need to maintain a proper air fuel ratio in order to maintain efficiency and reduce pollution. That's the whole idea uh, behind measuring oxygen and carbon monoxide. And uh, it basically comes down to the ratios of each and being uh, in tune. So enough oxygen uh, and everything is gonna be good. Not quite enough oxygen, we end up making carbon monoxide, which if you don't know yet, uh, you will know soon that carbon monoxide is very bad uh, and way too little oxygen and we just end up creating carbon or soot. And uh, that obviously has bad visual uh, effects if a facility is pumping black smoke out of their stack, uh, not desirable uh, from a public uh, observation perspective. So monitoring combustion in terms of oxygen and, and uh, carbon monoxide is what we do in order to uh, maintain proper operating efficiency. So the difference between um, good and bad uh, is called complete and incomplete combustion. So in, in one scenario, if everything's good, we call that complete. And if we have carbon monoxide or carbon as our products, we are going to call that incomplete combustion. And we'll, we'll work into many details about this as we move forward. Uh, hydrocarbons is what we're talking about mostly for the duration of this course. And get this out of the way. Uh, hydrocarbons contain hydrogen and carbon atoms. And that's it. Hydrocarbons contain hydrogen and carbon. And again, uh, after we get into the chemistry of this uh, in the chemistry uh, subject, this will become more and more evident for you. So let's look uh, real quick at the, at the very first type of combustion reaction or the easiest um, type of combustion reaction here. Uh, we have CH4, which is the chemical formula uh, for methane. Uh, and this tells us that methane is made up of one carbon and, and four hydrogens, uh, oxygen, which is made up of two atoms of oxygen gas here is what the ratio is where two atoms of oxygen uh, make up one molecule of oxygen gas and we have two of these molecules uh, and try not to get confused right off the bat here because i know we're adding a, a new set of numbers in here um, but this is uh this is what makes up the the compound or the component and then the bigger numbers here are the ratios that are required uh, in order to get the proper recipe and don't dwell too much on it at this moment in time because it'll get clearer uh, as we move as we move forward but this is a very basic uh, combustion uh, formula here so we're combining methane with oxygen uh, in some kind of a ratio to hopefully provide us with the products carbon dioxide water and heat when our products are carbon dioxide water and heat this is the definition of complete combustion. Uh, there is nothing technically bad uh, in here. Um, we won't talk about carbon dioxide and that kind of thing, but in terms of proper combustion, this is what we want to see. We want to see carbon dioxide because uh, it's better than carbon monoxide and way better than carbon. And we want to see water and we want to see heat. If we don't have these ratios correct, 
these numbers here basically, it's going to throw this out of whack and that's how we can tell whether or not we have complete or incomplete combustion. So analyzing for oxygen ensures that there will be complete combustion. We always want the products as they are above here. This is complete combustion. If there is CO or carbon as a product here, that indicates incomplete combustion and a problem. So <clears throat> uh, I'll just take this a little bit out of order right now. And uh, it's all about balancing, uh, balancing the ingredients in the reaction in order to get the proper products. Uh, and if we were to count the individual pieces on this side and count the individual pieces on this side, they should balance. And that's the long story. And I'll just walk you through this real quick. It's not something that's really, uh, I don't think, covered in this ILM, um, but it'll help making the next slide a little bit more understandable. So in this reaction, I'm basically taking uh, what we call one mole or, or one part of methane, and we're combining it with two parts of oxygen. That's what they use. That's what these big numbers mean. It's it's the ratio. So if I look at the uh, compounds on this side, I have one carbon, four hydrogens, and then I have two sets of oxygen, which means that I have four, actually four oxygen atoms, right? Two times two, two is four oxygen atoms, but it's actually just two molecules of oxygen gas. A minor detail, not something that you really have to worry about. We're, we're concerned about the numerical total of the individual elements here. So one carbon, four hydrogens, and in this case, this would constitute two times two, which is four oxygens. If I go to the other side here, you'll see I have one carbon, just like here. I have two oxygens here, and I have two times one oxygen here, which is also two, so that makes four, same as we have on this side. And I have two times two hydrogens here, which is four, same as we have on this side. So when that happens, we call that a balanced equation. And that's another way of indicating that we have complete combustion. But I, that's kind of a little tangent uh, we took off the trail there. Um, but that'll be something you'll be able to identify uh, moving down the road. That is important because the next slide here discusses what is air-fuel ratio. Uh, An air-fuel ratio is all about uh, making sure that we have the proper amount of air, which contains the oxygen that we need for combustion, in combination with the fuel. Um, you may have experienced uh, applications in life uh, where you have to, where you maybe know air fuel ratio. Uh, for example, uh, a gas engine in a in a car or an automobile or any type of gas engine uh, running gasoline has an air fuel ratio of about fourteen, uh, about fourteen to one which means that it takes 14 parts of air for every one part of fuel in order to get a complete combustion. If I have less or more, I would have incomplete combustion or at least some type of a combustion issue. So that's what we wanna be able to address when we look, when we look through here. So uh, looking quickly at, at the, uh, the formulas here, now that we've kind of dabbled in them here, I've got one part of fuel here, two parts of oxygen here so we can say that this is two to one and that's what we write it as two parts to one and when we have two to one we do our counting carbons to carbons hydrogens to hydrogen and oxygens to oxygens um, we, we know that they're the same on this side as they are on this side and when that happens we also end up with the proper products co2 and water uh, heat we don't show, we just take it as a given. Uh, and we say that this is complete and clean. So for methane, uh, the two to one ratio will give us complete combustion. Here's a different example. Now I've got two parts of methane to three parts of oxygen. Uh, and you can't really write it that way. You, know, you reduce it to the lowest common denominator. Uh, and that'll give us a ratio of one and a half to one, basically. And if we do the, the math across here and count the carbons and all that kind of stuff, you'll see that they don't balance out. And what we end up with here is two COs. And COs we are identified as a bad product. Uh, and this tells us that that's bad combustion because it has CO. This one here, last one, is one part of fuel and one part of oxygen or a one to one air fuel ratio. And if we do the math here, um, 
you will find that we end up with just the carbon all by itself in order to maintain that balance and that's a bad product so we call that incomplete combustion so the ideal air fuel ratio for methane is two to one and you'll be able to do this calculation for other things afterwards uh, it does get a little bit trickier um, because in the real world uh, we don't combine uh, a fuel with pure oxygen we combine it with air and the next couple of uh, slides will address that uh, problem. Um, but first, we're going to talk about uh, reinforcing, I guess, what we've already talked about, uh, the, the consequences of excess uh, or restricted oxygen. So excess oxygen creates carbon dioxide, which is OK. Uh, a shortage of oxygen creates carbon monoxide, uh, which is not bad. I mean, not good. An extreme shortage of oxygen creates carbon. So good, not really good, and pretty bad. Um, by adding one part of oxygen to two parts of carbon monoxide, it will create CO2 and burn, giving off heat. So we can we can adjust the amount of oxygen in order to get the proper product, right? All we did is we add a little bit more oxygen, and it turns this into this. So from not good to, to good. Okay, the same uh, things happen when we have the right amount of oxygen uh, and carbon. So we want to make sure that this mixture is correct for optimal efficiency and proper combustion and reduction of pollution. So that's kind of the whole idea behind this chunk of the ILM. Now, back to looking at air fuel ratios. Uh, using the previous example for methane, we, we, we saw that it took two moles. Uh, and this is a I'm throwing out a, a term that you probably haven't heard yet, but we'll call it's two moles um, or two units to make it simple for today, two units of oxygen to react with one unit of gas. Okay, ideally, this is what we call a uh, complete combustion and it works very well. Um, when we talk about it in terms of these units, the mole, which you'll be familiar with after the next chemistry class, uh, we call it the mole ratio, but it's just a ratio uh, of, of fuel to, to air or oxygen. Okay, uh, where this is going is in our theoretical calculations, we used oxygen, the gas, and oxygen, the gas, of course, is 100% oxygen. So if I had one mole of 100% oxygen, um, the, the math for that formula works out just great. But the reality of life is, is that we're not using pure oxygen, we're using air. So this is something we have to wrap our heads around here. So air, uh, as you know, or you will know now, uh, consists of about 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen, and then a bunch of other stuff. But long story short is the air that we breathe contains 21% oxygen. So we have to ask ourselves, how much air would I have to have in order to get the same amount of oxygen that I would get if I had pure oxygen, right? So pure oxygen is 100% oxygen and air is only 20% oxygen. Well, I would need five times this, right? To get 100% oxygen. That's really where we're going uh, with this calculation here. So 100% oxygen uh, divided by air, which is 21% oxygen, tells us that I need 4.76 units of air to equal the same amount as one unit of pure oxygen. And we have to get this out of the way right off the bat because we don't burn pure oxygen. It would not be uh, affordable uh, or safe for that matter. So all our calculations have to deal with um, the percentage of oxygen in air relative to pure oxygen here. So if we were doing our magical mathematical formula that we had uh, way back here, one part fuel, two parts oxygen, now we are doing that, that two parts oxygen based on air, which means that we need to have 4.76 times that amount. Uh, it tells us that we need 9.52 moles or parts of air for one mole of the fuel. And in this case, the actual air fuel ratio is 9.52 to 1. Okay, and that might sound complicated and tricky, but it's all we're really doing is we're making a compensation for the fact that we're not using 100% oxygen. And in order to equal the same amount uh, of theoretical 100% oxygen, we would have to have 4.76 times 
the amount of air to, to get that. And I hope that doesn't confuse you too much. It's not too bad. Uh, and once you get better at this, you'll be able to, uh, once you get better at this, you'll be able to do it for all the different types of fuels that comes, that comes later. Um, but we have to get that out of the way right away just to make sure that we understand that we're not burning 100% oxygen, we're burning air, which only has 21% oxygen. So in order to make an equivalency, we have to multiply that recipe by 4.76. Okay, uh, objective four here, uh, describing the principles of analysis and application of oxygen analyzers. So there's our wonderful oxygen molecule. Uh, and here's atmospheric gas makeup again, 78% nitrogen, 21-ish percent oxygen, and then some other little trace elements in there uh, as well. Okay, oxygen analyzers are used in a wide range of applications. Um, we focus a lot on combustion uh, here, but uh, we use it other, uh, we use oxygen analyzers in other places as well. Uh, sometimes we want oxygen like combustion and sometimes, uh, sometimes we don't. So for example, uh, nitrogen blankets uh, on top of vessels, well, you don't want oxygen in there. Uh, in natural gas, you probably don't want oxygen. Uh, in welding, uh, you don't want oxygen because that provides a, uh, contamination or oxidation. Brewing tanks at uh, your local uh, brew pub, same thing. If oxygen is there, it contributes to oxidation. No direct relation uh, between, well, I guess there is, I won't say that. Um, but there are times when oxygen is good, such as combustion, and there is times when oxygen uh, is bad, uh, such as we see in these examples here. Long story short, uh, oxygen is a reactant in combustion processes and it is also very necessary for life. So how do we detect and analyze oxygen? Uh, we look at some different hardware now in this section. Uh, two different categories, basically, of measuring devices that we're going to look at. Uh, the first category uh, is called paramagnetic sensors, uh, which means it has to do with, with magnetism. Uh, and we'll look at two devices here, a deflective type device and a thermal type device. And the second category is electrochemical sensors, and we'll be talking about electrochemical sensors uh, and liquid analyzers as well, so do pay attention there. Uh, paramagnetics are uh, strictly uh, oxygen as a, as a gas. Uh, electrochemicals can work as a gas uh, or a liquid. Uh, and we'll look at two spe specific uh, sensors, uh, the polarographic cell and the galvanic cell. Uh, as we move forward. Uh, last but not least, uh, probably the most talked about cell uh, in the ILM is this zirconium uh, oxide cell, which is only a gas, uh, only a gas measuring cell. Um, we will talk a little bit about each of these devices here. So first off, uh, paramagnetic sensors and how, how they work. Okay, paramagnetic analyzers rely on the magnetic properties of oxygen and you're like well wow, that's interesting who knew oxygen is what they call paramagnetic which means that it is attracted to a magnetic field some other paramagnetic gases include uh, nitrogen monoxide nitrogen dioxide and chlorine uh, dioxide if it has this paramagnetic or this attractive uh, attraction to a magnetic field we call it paramagnetic uh, if it repels magnetic field it is called diamagnetic. Uh, most gases are, are di diamagnetic. Uh, but the ones we're measuring, obviously this is oxygen is what we're more or less talking about here, uh, is paramagnetic. So here you, here you see an example. Uh, no oxygen, the magnetic lines of flux are quite wide. Uh, when there is oxygen present because it's uh, magnetic, it causes uh, the lines of flux to, to concentrate. Okay, the tiny oxygen molecules themselves end up behaving like tiny magnets and get trapped between the poles of the electromagnet. And that's kind of what you're looking at uh, in the diagram on the right. Okay, paramagnetism has two properties that are used. Uh, the first one is, and these are the key things to remember here, is that oxygen, because it's paramagnetic, uh, and as we said in the previous slide, I acts like to tiny magnets. Uh, oxygen increases the strength of magnetic fields 
And the second property of paramagnetism that we're, we're talking about when we're looking at these devices is that it loses this property when it gets hot. And you'll see as we look at the devices how we, uh, we utilize these principles in order to measure. Okay, there are a few types of analyzers that use this principle of measurement. Um, and they fall under the category of paramagnetic, uh, paramagnetic analyzers. And we look at two of them. Uh, number one is called a magnetodynamic oxygen analyzer. Uh, and in a very short form here, it uses a sensor, which is a little glass barbell, uh, and it moves in a magnetic field. So that's why we call it magnetodynamic, meaning that it's moving in a magnetic field. The second type is called a thermomagnetic oxygen analyzer. Uh, this one utilizes a flow of gas uh, and some heating elements and it uh, encourages uh, the flow of gas through this device um, by introducing cold gas and then heating it, which effect, you know, effectively makes a draft uh, through the device based on the amount of oxygen in the gas. Uh, and they call that draft a magnetic wind. Uh, and we'll look at these devices with a little bit more detail here in the next, uh, in the next slide. So magnetodynamic uses this little barbell and thermomagnetic uses something called magnetic wind. These are the buzzwords that we associate with these two devices. So first, magnetodynamic. Uh, here it is, we've got a couple of uh, magnets here, uh, a little reflective window here, a light, a light detector, a uh, feedback circuit that goes like this. And this little barbell here uh, pivots, right? And it's in a magnetic field. Uh, and depending on the gas that's that's going through it here, it says that the dumbbell is made of a diamagnetic glass, which is repelled away from the magnetic field. So as it gets repelled away from the magnetic field, it turns this mirror, uh, which in turn uh, moves the light from the light detector away. As I introduce uh, oxygen into the flow, it's going to counteract uh, the diamagnetic property of the barbell and cause it to go back the other direction and the light will then again be detected. So the relationship between how much this doesn't want to naturally be in the magnet area and the amount of oxygen that we introduce into it um, does what we call this paramagnetic deflection. Uh, the amount of deflection is proportional to the feedback current. This little dumbbell, uh, when I was in school many, 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 many years ago, uh, they had one of these analyzers and they could take it apart. And this little dumbbell is about the size uh, of an ant. It's really, really, really small. And the whole mechanism basically could fit on the end of your finger. Uh, so very delicate, uh, very delicate machines here. Okay, applications uh, for this magnetodynamic uh, style of oxygen me measurement, including uh, breathing air, atmospheric oxygen levels, pretty common for most of the devices that we're, uh, we're going to look at here. You can see that we, we're not really using it for combustion. Pros and cons, uh, small and portable is a pro in green. Uh, no oven, no warm up time, uh, which is kind of out of left field, but you'll see as we look at some of the other devices that do uh, have ovens and do have warm up time. So this is why it's a benefit or a, or a advantage here for this device. Um, cons or disadvantages is he, here is that other paramagnetic gases will also affect it. So it doesn't matter if it's oxygen or if it's uh, one of the other gases that we listed uh, earlier, nitrogen dioxide or nitrogen monoxide or chlorine dioxide. Uh, if it's got uh, those oxides in it, it's probably going to have some effect on it here as well. So that's something that you have to be aware of. Okay, that dumbbell again, as I, I told you a minute ago, is very sensitive and fragile, so you gotta treat it, treat it nicely. Um, only good for clean samples. So this is uh, nuts and bolts of mag magnetodynamic. The next one is called thermal uh, paramagnetic. And you see we got our uh, fancy little mechanism here, uh, a sample is uh, drawn in and it's cold, it heats up and is 
without getting into a whole bunch of thermodynamics, but as you heat up the air, it wants to travel. As it, as it travels across this way, it consequently ends up drawing in more cold air and creates what we call this magnetic wind, and that's the fancy buzzword for this particular device. So the oxygen is drawn uh, to the magnet in the tube, and you see magnet here, uh, magnet, uh, magnetic properties of oxygen, of course, it wants to go there. Uh, the oxygen is then heated by the coil, which means that it's gonna lose that magnetism, um, causing it to move along, and more magnetic oxygen will be drawn in. Uh, as the cooler oxygen replaces the warmed oxygen, it is forced to the right, as we see here, creating that magnetic wind. Have I said magnetic wind enough times yet? Okay, this cools, this cools the, the right resistor winding, uh, and the difference between these two uh, resistor temperatures are measured by our old friend Wheatstone, uh, and we can get a concentration from that. Okay, those were the uh, those first two. Next one, we're going to look at the electrochemical sensors here. Uh, electrochemical sensors, uh, well defined by their name, some kind of electrical property created by some kind of a chemical reaction. So that's where we get electrochemical. They generate a current or voltage, which is a result of a reaction involving the oxygen. The oxygen, as we said earlier, is a reactant in many different reactions, uh, but specifically in combustion. Uh, electrons play a major role in these sensors. Their movement from pole to pole is the electro part of electrochemical. The chemical reaction creates the movement of the electrons. The oxygen concentration affects the size of the voltage and current, depending on the device. And we will look at three different types of sensors. Uh, they are the zirconium oxide, as I said earlier, which is gas only, uh, the galvanic, which is used for gases and liquids, and the polar graphic, which is also used for gases and liquids. So let's have a quick look at these devices here. Oops, here we go. Okay, so high temperature zirconium oxide, not a great picture of it. Uh, the probes, as we see them in the ILM, are not really representative of what they are uh, in, the, in the real world. But what we have here is we have a reference gas on one side of the probe, some kind of a membrane, and we've got the zirconium oxide, and then we've got the sample gas on the other side of the probe. So we're comparing this concentration with this concentration. Um, whichever side is going to have the more is going to have the tendency to push its electrons in into its thing, and that's going to create a flow uh, from the more concentrated side to the less concentrated side, whichever whichever situation it happens to be. Uh, the bigger difference between the two sides, the more electron flow that we're going to get. The closer the two sides are together, uh, the less electron flow that we're going to get. And if we have equal amounts on both sides, there will be no electron flow whatsoever. And that's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge moment. Particular characteristics of the high temperature, high temperature zirconium oxide cell is that it operates above 600 degrees Celsius. So that tells you that it's hot and probably going to have a warm up time, probably going to have an oven, as we alluded to uh, earlier. The zirconium oxide acts as an electrolyte in the probe here. Sample and reference gases come into contact with electrode surfaces. Ionizing, ionizing into oxide ions. And of course, those uh, ions start to move. Uh, the potential on each electrode is the function of the partial pressure of the oxygen in each gas stream, or the concentration, to put it into simpler terms. Um, this concentration, this concentration on either side. Uh, it, is, it is a consequence of the partial pressure, um, but it's easier to understand if we say concentration. The electrode with a higher pressure will generate ion movement away from it. So in this case, ions are going to move away from the 20.9 side and go to this side, uh, getting picked up and measured by our uh, electronics up here. The voltage relates to partial pressure and is the measurement of the oxygen content. Uh, there is uh, calculations associated with this. Uh, the voltage is found using something called the Nernst equation. This, uh, 
This can be found on pages 31 and 32 in the ILM. And it's a long, uh, wicked kind of formula, but the good news for us is this is a constant. This is a given. This is a constant and these are given. So E is the voltage produced, R is the gas constant. Uh, in this particular equation, uh, this is it. Um, it may change depending whether it's metric or standard, um, but not to worry, you don't have to memorize them. They'll be given to you in, in the question. Uh, T for temperature uh, in Kelvin. Remember most uh, math that we do temperature related uh, particular formula math is going to be needed uh, to be converted into Kelvin. In case you forget, that's Celsius plus 273.15. Uh, this LN, not IN, LN is the natural log or uh, log 10, which is the log button on your calculator just as it exists on your calculator. So uh, you got a question here. If we were looking at this specific example that they show in the ILM here, what is the voltage generated when our concentration uh, of oxygen in our, um, sorry, in our reference side, which is instrument air, uh, contains 20.9% oxygen, and we use it because it's available, right? Instrument air is the reference, and our sample has 5% oxygen. So what's the millivolts going to be generated? Well, we can plunk it into the formula here, uh, given temperature uh, 800 degrees, so 800 plus 273.15 is 1073.15. And then the log of the reference gas over the sample gas, so 20.9 over 5, gives us 33.1 times 10 to the negative 3, or boom, 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 whatever that, however you'd like to write it. Uh, you pick your units as long as you get the right ones. Um, but 33.1 millivolts would be generated by this concentration. So um again i think we do have to do this math i know we absolutely used to have to do this math um so you want to make sure that you can run that through your calculator and get uh answers i don't see any um math questions in the back of the self-test um, that does not mean you will not see one in your future okay Calibration of the zirconium oxide, um, <clears throat> rather complicated. Um, requires use of a chart, uh, as we as we see here, to compare the voltage uh, generated to the oxygen concentration. And you're not going to have to do this, um, but you do have to kind of be aware of what's what's going on and what affects the cell. So cell voltage will decrease if the cell temperature decreases or the oxygen concentration increases. And these are these kind of things that are, uh, can be handy little cheats, especially in a multiple choice type, uh, multiple choice type question, right? If you're, uh, if you're given three millivolt, um, three millivolt values, uh, and you wanna know which, which of these millivolts represents the highest amount of oxygen, well, you can go, okay, well, the lowest, the lowest one is associated with uh, most oxygen. So these are little cheats that you can get out of uh, things like this. Okay, voltage is zero under uh, two conditions. Uh, you'll see here uh, the cell temperature either being below 600 degrees or the situation where the sample concentration is equal to the reference concentration, meaning that there is no ions uh, going in either direction because they're they're both the same. Okay, uh, looky here, we got a video, so let's uh, let's see if this video will play for us. I'll actually we'll finish this little part first. Okay, so uh, this zirconium oxide sensor can handle high temperatures because it operates at high temperatures, and as a result, it is commonly used in situ on stacks and ducts. So it can handle high temperatures. Uh, so it's one of the main ones for combustion. Okay, pros, uh, no sample system because it mounts right in line, thereby it has no lag time. Uh, also has very low maintenance because there's not much stuff associated with it. And it uses instrument air for reference. So everything there is really good. 
cons. Uh, the operating environment must be cooler than the probe's uh, six to 800 degree operating temperature, which is pretty easy to do. Uh, serviceability is low, meaning that if it does go bad, there's not much you can do about it. Uh, and incorrect readings in the presence of combustible uh, gases like carbon monoxide, for example. Uh, again, any other gas that has an oxygen, oxygen component in it would also, um, would also be red. <clears throat> so let's look at the video, maybe. Oh, this usually turns out to be a problem, doesn't it? Uh, Advertising on YouTube helps me reach engaged customers like Jenna, who's been searching for landscapers on Google. I know you probably don't see that, correct? Correct. All right. Let's see, if we can, let's see if we can make this happen. Oh, without getting too carried away here. Oh, my word. So when she watches YouTube, my ad's there. We can see the presentation there now, the video. Uh, for a second, yep. Yep, you're good. Okay. Key dope, key. With a link to schedule now. expertise in harsh process applications globally than any other supplier. Based on this experience, we have refined and developed the performance of our portfolio of instrumentation products to ensure that we meet your precise requirements every time. ABB is your partner for analytical solutions throughout the entire industrial landscape. From oxygen analysis in power plant applications to harsher environments in the process industries, the Endura range of analytical instrumentation can be used for a wide and varied range of applications. Let's now look in more detail at the Endura in situ oxygen analyzer range from ABB. Featuring a host of groundbreaking new features, the Endura AZ20 combines ABB's proven zirconia-based sensor technology with a versatile new electronic platform, truly making it the product of choice for a broad array of combustion applications. How does it work? The Endura AZ20 sensor uses a thin piece of zirconium material coated each side with porous platinum. Air is supplied to one side as a reference gas to provide a constant oxygen concentration. The process gas is presented to the opposite side. The platinum acts as a catalyst in the presence of oxygen gas, converting molecular oxygen to oxygen ions. These ions can then migrate through the solid zirconia electrolyte. When the oxygen concentration is equal on both sides, migration of the oxygen ions through the zirconia is zero. Where the concentration differs, the migration will increase to try to re-establish equilibrium. The differing reaction of the two electrodes generates a corresponding potential difference that can be used to measure the oxygen concentration in the process gas. How is it different? Tough made easy. That's the philosophy behind the development of the whole Enduro range, leading to a product that offers reliable, trouble-free operation in even the most arduous processes. A key feature is the robust design. ABB's new ceramic to steel bonding process offers improved resistance to both thermal and mechanical stresses and shocks. This greatly extends the life cycle of the cell. 
The electrode bonding technique offers better resistance to sulfurous atmospheres. Ideal for sulfur recovery processes, crematoria, and industrial and clinical waste. Another feature is the inclusion of integrated automatic calibration control technology. This eliminates the need for expensive ancillary equipment typically needed for traditional flue gas oxygen analyzer systems. What varieties and models are available? Available with a choice of probe lengths up to 4 meters or 13 feet, the Endura AZ20 range covers a full spectrum of low and high temperature industrial applications. Up to 800 degrees Celsius or 1470 degrees Fahrenheit. Local probe mount and remote transmitter options give you complete control of your analyzer wherever it is installed. ABB's intuitive operator interface means even inexperienced operators can quickly master programming or reconfiguration without specialist help. So where would you use it? Monitoring the levels of oxygen in flue gas emissions is a relatively straightforward, low-cost way to assess the efficiency of a combustion process. By measuring the level of oxygen present in a boiler flue or furnace, it is possible to obtain data that can be used to optimize the air-to-fuel ratio to ensure maximum heat is extracted from the fuel. ABB's Endura AZ20 combustion gas analyzers are suitable for a wide range of emissions monitoring and combustion control applications across a wide range of sectors, including power generation, chemical oil and gas, captive power and steam raising plant, municipal waste incineration, crematoria, and hospitals, including incineration of clinical waste. Why would you use it? Whether you're looking for a way to improve your combustion efficiency or comply with local regulations on emissions to air, the Endure range offers an ideal starting point. Enabling accurate measurement of flue gas the AZ20 provides all the data you need to make an informed decision on your next step. What after-sale support? With fewer parts requiring servicing or replacement, the AZ20 offers straightforward maintenance. Should a problem occur, however, the use of no more compliant diagnostics makes it quick and easy to trace a fault, with alarms and warning displayed in clear text. The transmitter unit can also be interrogated and reconfigured without removing the glass cover, using infrared through the glass control technology. All products in the Endura range are also backed up by ABB's comprehensive support network. Benefits With the ABB Endura AZ20 range, you get a groundbreaking new product backed up by over 90 years experience in combustion gas analysis. So, to summarize, the Endura AZ20 range of combustion gas analyzers gives you ease of operation, choice of local or remote control, Robust probe design. Reliable measurement. Ease of maintenance. So there we have it. The Endura range from ABB gives you
marvelous. New levels of accuracy. All right. Uh, hopefully we're back to the PowerPoint. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, I probably could have cut some of that uh, video out. Um, not doesn't matter what manufacturer we're talking about. That was a, that was a good video. Uh, There's lots of good information that that video that I thought reinforced some of the things that we talked about in some of the slides that we've seen, uh, particularly the the part where you you see how the uh, the E is generated as you get the concentration difference across the, the cell membranes there is, uh, I thought, a very valuable uh, visual for you guys. So, um, yeah, so that was uh, high temperatures are quinine oxide. So perfect. Well, how close are we here? What's next here? Objective five. Uh, principles, analysis, and applications of combustion analyzers. Why is my screen all goofy here today? Okay, um, combustion analyzers measure the concentrations of oxygen and other combustible gases that are in the products of combustions. Uh, gases such as carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and unburnt fuels. These are all bad things to have in uh, our stack or as products of combustion, so we want to um, be monitoring all of these things. Um, we use combustion analyzers to optimize the combustion process to ensure efficiency, as we saw from the uh, video there. Ideally, you want to get the most heat out of your fuel, and uh, you don't want to be polluting anything. Um, we want to reduce the toxic gas output, obviously. Uh, monitor carbon monoxide for worker safety, as well as monitoring for pollution. So uh, combustion isn't just uh, about money, it's uh, it's also about safety, uh, and it's also about the environment. Uh, holy moly, this is a long PowerPoint. All right, uh, combustion analyzer types. So we're going to look at three different analyzer types here: the catalytic combustible, uh, the carbon monoxide electrochemical, and then carbon monoxide infrared analyzers. Uh, and again, these are uh, used for safety. Um, and also for uh, efficiency purposes. Okay, here's a catalytic combustion um, style, style analyzer here. You see we have the flue gas uh, coming through our measuring cell there. We have a catalytic filament, filament uh, and a reference filament, both going to our good old friend, uh, the Wheatstone Bridge here. So the catalytic combustion principle of operation is that one of these filaments is uh, heated, uh, causing the fuel to burn, uh, increasing its temperature. The other one is not heated, so we end up getting uh, a difference between the heat that is detected by these uh, two these two cells. Um, and the amount of oxygen is measured through the heat produced uh, during that during that combustion. So a relatively simple, uh, relatively simple device there, catalytic combustion. Uh, the difference in the resistance, of course, in each cell is measured, which indicates the oxygen con uh, content. And again, they will measure all combustibles uh, that are present. So we haven't really talked about uh, haven't really talked about other combustibles, but things like hydrogen gas uh, and carbon monoxide are are also combustibles. Um, so we need to be aware that those can also be measured by some of these devices. Okay, carbon monoxide uh, electrochemical sensor. Um, like most electrochemical sensors that we've discussed so far, uh, the sample permeates some kind of a membrane where it then reacts with an electrode, uh, which set frees, uh, sets free some electrons, which create a, a voltage or a current that is proportional uh, to the carbon uh, monoxide content because we're specifically uh, talking about carbon monoxide. Um, and you will see that some of these combustion analyzers contain uh, elements that can measure both oxygen uh, and carbon monoxide. So these would both be uh, electrochemical cells wrapped up inside of this one analyzer housing. So a combustion analyzer really can do uh, both of the measurements. Okay, uh, again, just uh, to reiterate kind of how it works here, um, basically a pump draws a sample 
through the sensors. It permeates uh, permeates the membrane, and it's often some type of a plastic. Teflon is very common. Uh, reacts with an electrode, and makes electrons. We get electrons that flow, and we capture that uh, capture that flow as a proportional representation of the uh, carbon monoxide. Okay, carbon monoxide infrared analyzer. We uh, basically already looked at. Uh, we've already looked at this before. Uh, in terms of application, exactly the same. Uh, IR source transmits across the stack. Uh, the amount of light that's received is used to derive the measurement. Um, as the CO increases, the signal uh, that's received over here is is reduced, or the CO absorbs more of the light, thus less gets to this side. Uh, and it works essentially the exact same as that IR uh, moisture analyzer that we talked about earlier in this lecture. Uh, this can be uh, applied either in situ or with the sample system. So uh, this looks more like a sample system to me. Um, commonly, these are mounted uh, literally on opposite sides of the, of the stack. Okay, so here's kind of a better look at that uh, across the stack carbon monoxide IR detector, so light source on one side, detector on the other. Um, different mounting locations, just to kind of review some of these we looked at a few lectures ago. Uh, at line mounting, uh, so catalytic combustion analyzer, good application there. Uh, B is distant or extractive, so um, basically we're just pulling out the sample, transporting it through a sample handling system somehow uh, to, a, to a distant location. Uh, and then, of course, our path style or in situ across the stack application for these combustion uh, style analyzers. Oh, there we go, sudden end. So that's the end of uh, gas analyzers part B. Uh, part C uh, deals more still with combustion. Um, so we'll look forward to uh, that in the next lecture.